What follows is a lecture on the life and times of Pulteney Bigelow. In this lecture, I attempt to answer the question, was he an elitist, an anti-Semite, committed to Henry George's grand reform, even as he embraced the white man's burden? Here's a quote from Samuel Clemens that sets the tone for some of this discussion. The white man's burden has been sung. Who will sing the brown man's? Well, I doubt that anyone other than historians of the progressive era or their students have any knowledge of Pulteney Bigelow. Yet, during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, he was a widely read journalist and author who held controversial views on the state of the world and about the peoples it contained. An article on Pulteney Bigelow written by Kiko Sugiyama explains why we would benefit by knowing something of his life and his work. Sugiyama wrote, His life and time shed light on the transitional period of American nation building. He shared the disappointment of many with post-Civil War America. He shared racism as well. His concept of race was the opposite of the affirmation of differences that we cherish now. He was a product of an age marked by the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1881, the Haymarket Riot of 1886, the Dawes Act of 1887, the Supreme Court ruling in Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, the War of 1898, and the St. Louis, Louisiana Exposition in 1904. His message was clear that Africa was the last frontier for white man's conquest, and he thought that Africans were like children who needed proper guidance by the white man. As the life story of Pulteney Bigelow unfolds in this lecture, a more complex and nuanced understanding of his beliefs emerges, I believe. Much that follows comes directly from his autobiography, published in 1925 at the age of 70. He was born in New York City in 1855. His father, John, was at that time the co-owner and co-editor of the New York Evening Post, along with William Cullen Bryant. His family had been in North America since the early 17th century, first settling in Massachusetts. John Bigelow, an opponent of slavery, joined the newly formed Republican Party in 1856 and worked for the election of Abraham Lincoln as President of the United States. After the election, John was appointed by Lincoln as the United States Consul in Paris. While Consul, he wrote the book The United States of America in 1863 in an effort to counteract the growing desire of the French people for a dissolution of the American Union. Then, after the end of the American Civil War, he was named Minister to France. Young Pulteney completed part of his formal education in France as well as Germany. In Germany, he became acquainted with Prince Wilhelm, the future Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany. Their friendship would play an important role in his future work as a journalist and author. Years later, he described the Germany of that era as follows. The aristocracy was poor in purse and lived on their estates, where they ruled their peasantry in semi-barbarous fashion. From this peasantry and its masters, the Prussian monarchy drew a supply of military power unequaled then in Europe. Pulteney was already learning a good deal about what political economists had been describing as the great land question. His own life seemed to be charmed. Already he was beginning to contemplate a future in which opportunities would be almost limitless. In his autobiography he wrote, When the time came for me to think of other things in school romps, my father told me to think over the matter of going to college. This was in the spring of 1870 at Gotha. I was then 14 and had an idea that all wisdom emanated from the university. 
that before entering its portals, we were merely humans. But after four years, we graduated onto a plane so high that people deferred to our opinion for the one reason that we had been to college. At school in Germany, he learned Greek and Latin, coming away with great admiration for many of his teachers. The family finally returned to New York in 1867, the return to which he later described as coming, quote, to a new country, to a community transformed by the Civil War almost as much as was that which received Rip Van Winkle after his Catskill coma. The southern states were impoverished, if not financially wrecked. The northern states bristled with evidence of new gotten gains. Slaves there were none, but black tramps and perchable votes far too many. The war had saddled us with depreciated paper money and consequent high cost of living. Poldney and his siblings were then sent to a boarding school in Providence, Rhode Island, run by the Society of Friends, of which he later recalled, This educational institution, on a most excellent foundation, was by us children regarded merely as the Quaker jail, and was run more on the lines of a reformatory than a school for the children of gentle folk. Poultney entered Yale University in 1873 and graduated in 1879. Six years was required to earn his degree because of health problems. Of his education at Yale, he later wrote, I learned nothing at Yale comparable to what I learned before and after. My tastes ran in lines of literature and history, and in this field, Yale was barren. This did not mean that his years at Yale had little effect on his thinking. One professor whose lectures he took seriously was the economist and free trader David A. Wells, who had served as head of the newly established Federal Revenue Commission from 1866 to 1869. During this time, Wells acquired a reputation as the leading fiscal authority in the United States. While at Yale, he also befriended a Japanese student named Yoshio Kozaka, who went on in 1876 to study political economy under Stanley Jevons at University College in London before returning to Japan in 1880. Pulteney needed a reprieve from life at Yale, so in September of 1875, he boarded a sailing ship owned by the family friend A.A. A. Lowe bound for Yokohama, Japan, reaching their destination the first day of February 1876. Then disaster struck. We had beaten so far into the bay as to make out a lighthouse on our port far ahead, when crash, the skipper and I felt the ship suddenly grind under a sunken rock, then slowly settle down by the stern and then heel over to port so sharply that we could hardly walk. The ship was a wreck, and as it proved, a total wreck. Though ready to fight for their lives, they were rescued by the local Japanese and tenderly cared for. While the rest of the crew recovered, Pulteney was escorted by a Scot, the representative of Lloyd's Marine Insurance in Japan, to Yokohama. Pulteney then made his way to the American Embassy in Tokyo. There, he was invited to speak to university students on the subject of colonial expansion. He also reconnected with Yoshio Kusaka, now in the Treasury Department of the government. At first extremely formal, once alone their old friendship was renewed. We exchanged experiences, and from that moment he seemed to have only one ambition to make me understand Japan as no American up to that moment had ever been permitted to. Pulteney remained in Japan long enough to learn to speak Japanese and gain an appreciation for the complexities of Japanese culture and politics, as well as what the Japanese had learned about international relations with Western powers. 
A less generous people would have seen in the acts of our war vessels merely reasons for petty reprisal. Not so Japan. She was quick to learn the lessons of international intercourse as practiced by the great powers of Christendom. An extensive tour of China followed, but in the fall of 1876, Pulteney returned to the United States and to his studies at Yale. I had left New Haven a broken spirit, brooking on suicide. In two years, I had circumnavigated the globe, touched life at half a dozen different angles, and met and measured myself with men of many creeds, races, and national prejudice. The manner in which he measured himself would be revealed in the pages of the 11 books he eventually wrote. Back at Yale, his interest in political economy grew. His father was a strong proponent of free trade policies, and Pulteney was greatly influenced by the lectures of William Graham Sumner, also a free trader. After completing his undergraduate degree at Yale, he studied the law at Columbia. He later described fellow law student Theodore Roosevelt as an excellent specimen of the genus Americanus egotisticus. Over the next three decades, he intermittently practiced the law. However, his first actual work involved founding of a magazine of amateur sport called Outing. He then helped to convert the Yale Current into an illustrated college weekly. The pages included sketches by a young Frederick Remington. Admitted to the bar, he opened a small office in New York City. Referrals from friends kept him busy, but he was also very much engaged in politics and civic affairs. My law office looked busy, but the business was largely non-legal. Committee work and political organizations for the purification of Congress in Tammany Hall, the election of Theodore Roosevelt as member of the New York State Assembly, the combating of protectionism, the securing of any honest copyright, the discussion of Henry George's progress in poverty. Pulteney had met Henry George in New York in 1880 and quickly befriended the as yet little known author newly arrived from California. Of Henry George and their relationship, Pulteney wrote in 1921, of the many and noble and unselfish men that have loomed on my social and literary horizon, Henry George stands out with his remarkable vividness. His life is perhaps the nearest to that of our Savior, which it is possible for an American to live. A little club of Henry George students met weekly in my bachelor rooms near Gramercy Park. Mr. George listened always with utmost courtesy, and in his answers had a winning manner of apparently sympathizing with his interlocutor. Many were the long walks and talks we had together. He was now working for James Gordon Bennett as an assistant editor on the New York Herald newspaper. As the only person who spoke German and French as well as English, Pulteney was eventually promoted to take over as the newspaper's foreign department editor. His promotion came at the expense of Worthington Ford, a friend Pulteney greatly respected. Would what happened to his friend happen to him working for James Gordon Bennett, he wondered? I could not feel much security when such a valuable man as Worthington Ford would be dismissed so curtly, nor could any of us discover any reason for his removal. It certainly was a wholesome warning to me. As for him, he was immediately offered an excellent position at Washington in the State Department. Across Pulteney's desk came a constant flow of information on the political battles between protectionists and free traders. He began to interview the heads of U.S. manufacturing firms on the issue, including Andrew Carnegie, who confirmed to Pulteney his support of free trade. Of course, 
it would be unfair if all other industries were subsidized by the tariff and mine alone forced into the world's competition. When I say that I am for free trade, I mean free trade for all equally. Of course, Andrew Carnegie was always focused on opportunities to expand his business empire. So, when Pulteney was later living in Germany, Carnegie approached him with an offer few men in Pulteney's position would have refused. The bribe was in the shape of a commission, as he called it. I was to secure orders from the German emperor for steel plates for his warships, and every ship so supplied was to mean a big sum of money for me, as I recall, about $150,000 each. I declined the offer, and he set me down as a fool. Maybe I told him that a fool might get as far as a knave, but I forget. In 1882, Pulteney was sent as the newspaper's foreign correspondent to Europe. There he hoped to accompany Henry George, as George spoke throughout England and Scotland. However, Bennett, a conservative Catholic, held a very negative view of Henry George and forbade Pulteney from covering George's lectures. The time had come for Pulteney to strike out on his own. I endured the London office for a few months. When finding that I was expected to interview the notables of Europe, I resigned and found to my great delight that I could earn more by writing to please myself. He began writing more and more frequently on politics and economics. His articles published in many newspapers across Europe. One conclusion he reached was that the reading public in the United States seem more concerned about the lives of socialites than about serious questions of public policy. Over the years, Pulteney had occasionally kept in touch by letter with Germany's Prince Wilhelm. Now in 1888, his youthful friend had become Germany's Kaiser. Pulteney was provided with an almost unrestricted access to Germany's affairs of state. For eight years in succession, 1888 to 96, the Kaiser made me his guest at every important palace function, at every military maneuver on a large scale, even on his yachting cruise to the Golden Horn, when he stopped in Athens for the purpose of marrying his unfortunate sister Sophie to the Duke of Sparta, later King Constantine. Kaiser Wilhelm II was a subject of Pulteney's first book, the German Emperor, published in 1889. The book, a very personal analysis, attracted positive reviews but did not generate many sales. After a long career as an author, Pulteney reflected on the financial fate of most authors. The young author may think that much press notice means much money. The old author knows better. It is the newspaper that profits, not the man who has laboriously given his lifeblood in the making of a real book. The editorial shears cut deep into the quick of its literary victim. They extract a few good stories and piquant phrases, patch up these with a condensation of the main story, and thus please the thrifty and hasty public that gets for one penny all that he needs at that moment. And thus does an author meet hundreds who congratulate him upon a book which they have not bought, but of which they have learned through the brain-sucking machine, the daily press. Pulteney's autobiography is rich in the detail of life in Germany during this period, introducing readers to the many leading figures he encountered at numerous diplomatic and social functions. The tensions between the Germans and their French neighbors was an ever-present subject in his articles. France and Germany lived side by side as those do who daily look for an outbreak of hostilities. Courtesies between the two countries had ceased with 1870. They each maintained the outward semblance of diplomatic intercourse, including an exchange of military attaches, but it was painful duty. 
Within Germany, tensions existed between the Prussian landed aristocracy and those who worked the land, described by Pulteney as Bismarckian squirearchy. Pulteney expressed great concern that Germany was falling victim to its own policies of protection and the heavy expenses incurred to support the nation's imperial aspirations. Industrialists and other producers grew accustomed to export subsidies. He concluded that these policies were important contributions to the outbreak of war. Bismarck had beaten France, and now he intended to beat England by subsidizing factories and then forcing their output upon the world's markets. This reckless policy led inevitably to the Great War of 1914, but in 1880, Germans were dazzled by the prospect of immediate profits at England's expense. Germany in 1914 reaped the whirlwind of war after diligently sowing the poisonous wind of protectionist expansion and fiscal inflation. At the same time, there is the curious case of Germany's imperial outpost in China. Pulteney compares the early conditions there with conditions in regions influenced by the British occupation. The German work was a mess because it was directed by Berlin bureaucracy. The British work at We Hai We went smoothly from the start because it was in the hands of administrators who knew China and were gentlemen in the bargain. I paddled my canoe up and down and about this first of Germany's ports in China and talked with many Germans, both military and mercantile. The military were disgusted, and the mercantiles cursed the military for having no common sense, for antagonizing the natives, and for their overweening behavior towards such as wore no uniform. Speaking at the 7th International Congress of Geographers in Berlin in 1899, Pulteney pointed to at least one aspect of German colonial policy with which he agreed. Kyo Chao deserves in a very high degree the widest attention of the general public. Here for the first time the principles of land values taxation are applied in practice. The above statement by Pulteney was quoted in an article written by Dr. Ludwig Schremer, the former land commissioner of Kyo Chao, published in the March-April 1911 issue of the Single Tax Review. Dr. Schremer goes on to describe the steps taken to implement the taxation of land values in the colony. In no instance has the administration made a free gift of the land to the first comer. The fact that the area of Kiachau was ceded by China to the German Empire in March 1898 in order to establish a commercial settlement caused at once an enormous increase in the value of the land and a further increase was foreseen to be certain with the execution of the contemplated railway and harbor facilities. The government bought the land from the Chinese peasants at the prices ruling before the time of the occupation, whilst the prices realized at the first auction were in keeping with the expenditure and intentions of the government for the future development of the settlement. The government of one mind in this case with the body of the inhabitants of the colony, all of whom are benefited, has not fared badly with this policy. Although his work kept him focused on European affairs, Pulteney was never very confident in the future of the United States. As did Henry George, he worried about what he saw as the systemic imbalance between the interests of the propertied and those who lived at the margin with little or no hope of improvement. We of the great democracy see many rocks and shoals ahead of our beloved ship of state. On the one hand, those who regard popular majorities as justified in plundering the minority by means of taxes and on the other hand, the party of property desperately resolved to do as they choose with what is theirs. 
Among the most serious rocks and shoals threatening the great democracy Pulteney cherished was the regional tensions between citizens living in the northern states and those in the Old South. The memory of the Civil War remained strong and the presence of the Negro population a challenge to white prejudices everywhere. Pulteney believed there are deep systemic reasons why persons of color have failed to advance even after many decades following the end to slavery. Today, as I pen these lines, Negroes have lost much of their glamour, even in the eyes of New England. They now form a not inconsiderable segment of every northern city where the work is easy and the wages are high. They have now, for two generations at least, enjoyed the economic advantages of American citizenship, plus a knowledge of the language. Northern schools and universities are open to Negro students, and so are our national military schools. They start life with many advantages, and yet we of the North are perpetually pestered by pitiful appeals for money to found or enlarge iliomocenary institutions amongst our blacks. How could such a well-traveled person be ignorant of the actual conditions endured by those who less than a generation earlier had been released from the imprisonment that is slavery? The majority of this segment of the population struggled in competition with large numbers of newly arrived immigrants for work and housing at the bottom of the economic ladder. While whites reclaimed supremacy in the South, whites never relinquished their domination in the North. In fact, only those whites, also Anglo-Saxon and Protestant, were to be fully embraced. In his autobiography, he expressed sorrow that neither the South nor the North had leaders who recognized the wisdom of compromise. Instead, they took the nation through a long and destructive war. He equated the outcome to a, quote, Bolshevistic upheaval that should have been avoided at all costs. Had the Northern pulpits preached the golden rule and permitted Southern pulpits to preach as they chose, it is possible that within a few years, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, Kentucky, and Tennessee would of themselves have inclined towards a gradual abolition of slavery. But by one revolutionary wrench, a majority in Congress destroyed local self-government in every southern state, set free an African population which in some sections outnumbered the whites, gave the ballot unreservedly to every former slave, and made him at the same time eligible to hold governmental positions from which he could issue orders to his former masters. From Pulteney's perspective, the end of slavery did not really liberate the people who had been long enslaved. Unprepared for self-government and self-sufficiency, they were simply subjected to a new set of controlling interests. Moreover, he believed the nation had done enough. In 1905, there were more universities for Negroes in the United States than in all of the German Empire for a population of 60 millions. These grandly sounding seats of African scholarship were maintained mostly by northern money given in charity. Our Negroes naturally preferred living on genteel charity than working hard for a living. Thus have northern plutocrats and philanthropists unwittingly debauched a people that should have been encouraged in honest labor. Negroes with white blood now aspire to a social rating based on college degrees and political office. The country swarms with mulatto lawyers, journalists, dentists, poets, physicians, and school teachers, but advertise for a manual worker and you will get few applicants. The most fanatical of New England abolitionists never dreams of electing a Negro to his club or of sitting beside him in theater or church, least of all of introducing him to the intimacy of his home. Many of our most respectable universities, including Yale and Harvard, officially matriculate them, 
but socially this means little unless they be accepted in the fraternities on an equal footing. In our big cities are streets where only Negroes live, and the surest way to depreciate the value of any street is to introduce Negro tenants there. Are these the observations and conclusions of someone with deep racial prejudices? Or was Pulteney Bigelow chastising his government for a failure to match public policy with human motivation? There was no nation and no people he had not interacted with during his long life. He asked to be judged based on those experiences. Personally, I have no prejudices, least of all against mere color. I have sympathies and repulsions, also an appreciation of relative human values. The Negro I have known and measured in every American slave state, no less than in most of the West Indian islands, and also in South and Central America. I have studied him also in many parts of Africa, North and South. My knowledge on that vexed subject may not be large, but it is apt to be nearer the truth than that of my philanthropical fellow citizens whose opinions have been a reflection of Booker Washington. Pulteney spends a good portion of a chapter explaining why he found Booker T. Washington to be a less than heroic figure to be emulated by others of his race. Kiko Sugiyama sees something sinister in Pulteney's attitudes toward African Americans. For Pulteney Bigelow, Negroes must not be raised by any means to the higher level of the white race. Yet it was precisely compatibility and a disciplined work ethic that were required of all members of the diverse American society at the turn of the century. Washington was trying to convince his audience of exactly that point by proving that African Americans could contribute to the larger society. For Pulteney, his dislike of Booker T. Washington was personal, or at least he convinced himself this was so based on just a single meeting. I took a dislike to him at first sight. I was thrust upon him by an eminent professor of Harvard University. He asked me to a dinner which the choices of Boston clubs was giving in honor of the black celebrity. I answered that I would accept. But as for their guest of honor, I regarded him as one who should be back in the South earning an honest living. Booker T. as guest of honor addressed an audience that could not have been surpassed for scholarship and social prestige. He told his plantation stories. He rehearsed the grievances of his race. He forgot that he was a guest in Massachusetts and strongly hinted that the Negroes of America were now demanding what was their due and that they might seize by force what was denied them in the courts of law. A clear indication of Pulteney's reputation as an insightful reporter on international events occurred upon the outbreak of war in Cuba. He was immediately engaged by the London Times as the papers were correspondent. The United States had now fully emerged as a national power to be reckoned with on the global stage. Victory over a humbled Spain pulled the United States west all the way to the Philippines and ever more deeply into intrigues below its southern border. Pulteney did not seem to be bothered by expansionism itself only by what he saw as the counterproductive administration of the colony secured. We permit nearly everything to our colonists except liberty. They may not import anything save under heavy penalties, not even labor for their plantations. We have done all that money can do to make our natives happy, but it is cold comfort, this perpetual paying of millions and seeing no return for our taxes. Kiko Sukiyama concludes that Pulteney was a vocal representative of, quote, the last expression of overt Anglo-American white supremacy, fighting against the evolving new era that demanded a national unity that included non-whites. In short, Pulteney was on the wrong side of history. 
Bigelow's overt racism, which included a hatred of mixed marriages and his attack on missionary activities because in his thinking they would produce a Christian population capable of casting ballots, were considered dangerous. His praise of Japanese colonial activities and the role he took as a Japanese propagandist were also considered threatening. His advocacy of Japan as an emerging power across the Pacific contradicted the developing American image of a Pacific empire. Pulteney Bigelow represented the opposite of the path that the United States was choosing to take. At the 1906 meeting of the American Political Science Association, Pulteney once again challenged mainstream attitudes towards U.S. expansionism describing what he observed while visiting the Isthmus of Panama. The administration at Washington has pronounced, through many costly reports, that the work there is admirable and that all who differ from this opinion are unpatriotic and malicious. Personally, I walk through a swamp, which Mr. Roosevelt sees in time of flood and declares to be a magnificent reservoir. Personally, I am an imperialist, if that means that it is our duty to bring happiness and prosperity to several overheated sections of the earth that have become ours since the War of 1898. I believe that the task is within our power, provided that we approach it not as politicians, but practical students of the truth. Reading through Pulteney Bigelow's autobiography, I was somewhat surprised to not find any record of anything written about or a relation with Cecil Rhodes, whose diamond-generated wealth was put to work in the interest of an ever-expanding British Commonwealth, spreading Anglo-Saxon culture and institutions to every corner of the globe. Nor did Pulteney refer to the partnership between Rhodes Alfred Milner and others to bring together leading Anglo-American internationalists in a secretive body known as the Round Table. Pulteney was certainly aware that after the end of the First World War, British members formed the Royal Institute of International Affairs to advance their aims, and in the United States their American counterparts established the Council of Foreign Relations. The American historian Carol Quickly was one of the first to provide the general public with the design of this enterprise. Quigley wrote, The powers of financial capitalism had another far-reaching aim, nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. Although Pulteney denied prejudice against any group of people, in his autobiography he reveals a peculiarly negative view of Jewish people. Today the United States is probably more Jews than all the rest of the world, thanks to the Hirsch Fund and its able political committee in Washington. Our immigration agents may with impunity turn back families of Norwegian, Danish, English, or Scotch extraction. And the matter ends there. But let the most undesirable Jew from the Russian border be excluded, and the American press makes flaming articles about race prejudice. The Jew wants no farm in Palestine or anywhere else. He wants New York, where he can underbid and undersell, and play with our legal paragraphs. It is but little over a century that Jews have enjoyed full freedom of trade in the Old World, in that short time, they have managed to absorb the leading roles in money-making to say nothing of controlling the stage and journalism. They cannot yet be elected to a social club of importance, but soon the white race in America will be too poor to afford any club. When that day arrives, we shall all join the Ku Klux. 
we shall then be too hungry to distinguish between good and bad Jews. We shall have a grand and bloody house cleaning and commence life anew on an old fashioned 100% American basis. An editor of American Hebrew asked simply, quote, what is it the Jews have done to Poltney Bigelow that in his old age he praised God for a pogrom in America? He proves again that it is the Jew who turns the other cheek and the Bigelow type of Christian who smites it hard and gleefully. This raises yet another enigma surrounding Poltney Bigelow. The fact that the movement started by Henry George attracted many supporters of Jewish heritage, none more prominent in the movement than the industrialist and philanthropist Joseph Fells. I have found no record of any relationship or even communication between these two. Arthur Dudden's biography of Joseph Fells makes no mention of Pulteney. At least during the decades leading up to the First World War, Pulteney looked at Germany as ruled by his friend Kaiser Wilhelm as the nation to be emulated. He explained what he meant in an article written for the Single Tax Review in 1912. To say that Germany is 50 years ahead of this country in what is best in socialism is to state the matter with great moderation. While New York deliberately destroys the fish which once swarmed in the Hudson River, while it even burdens the taxpayer in order to waste the most precious asset of the farmer, the fertilizer of his fields, Berlin utilizes all its sewage and street sweepings by enriching farm after farm in the suburbs and in keeping the river which flows through its streets so clean that all may drink from it with impunity and fish are so abundant that the people profit enormously from this source alone. The most beautiful river in America is now little more than a national sewer. Poultney always came into contact with people in government who knew what to do and did it well, in many cases in spite of the directives they received from superiors. How the British administered their colonial empire was, he observed, far superior to that of the Germans. In a 1918 paper, he explains, From Hong Kong go thousands of Chinese annually to labor under contract. They are confident that the conditions under which they embark will be observed, that the wages mentioned will be punctually paid, that the food will be adequate and the housing according to the sanitary rules, that the labor will be done under wholesome conditions. In short, that after five years of enlistment as a laborer, the Chinaman, Hindu or Kafir may count upon a return to his home satisfied that the British Commissioner of Native Labor has paternally watched over his interests and encouraged others to follow in his steps. No other country can point to such victories in the field of peaceful colonial conquest as England for the last three quarters of a century. There is no other colonial field of my acquaintance where I would feel safe in walking from end to end with no weapon more destructive than a bamboo cane. A rather different perspective was provided in the May 1920 issue of Land and Liberty by William R. Lester, author of Unemployment and the Land, following a three-week visit to Jamaica. The hot and enervating climate puts anything like hard work by Europeans out of the question so that their function is purely to superintend the black. The white planter is making money quickly and spending it in London, but there is a fly in the ointment, the native. On him they depend to cultivate the plantations. Steady work is not now to be got out of him. He is dissatisfied with his condition, is getting independent in his ideas, and truculent in his bearing. Once landed on the island, a very short experience must impress the visitor with three outstanding facts. The wonderful fertility of the soil, the poverty of the people, and the amount of unused land. 
It is worth noting that there was some interest in adopting the taxation of land values by Jamaica's colonial government going back to the end of the 19th century. But nothing happened until 1943 when a commission of inquiry recommended the existing property tax be replaced with a tax on the unimproved land value. The full story can be read in this volume edited by Robert Andelson. By the late 1920s, Pulteney Bigelow began to withdraw from the public eye. The last published article I could find by him was an admiring story of ex-Kaiser Wilhelm II living in exile in Holland. The article appeared in the Philadelphia Inquirer in July of 1930, soon after Pulteney's return. An article appearing in a 1933 issue of The Nation linked Pulteney with the group Friends of Germany promoting Nazi propaganda in the United States. At some point, Pulteney publicly denied any association with this organization, although he seems early on to have expressed that Mussolini and Hitler were providing necessary leadership to their countries. During early 1933, he was in Australia and spoke at a luncheon held by the Henry George League and the Tariff Reform League held in Melbourne. His remarks focused on what he saw as systemic causes of the depression strangling the nation. It is a joy to me to find that there are other people with troubles such as we have at home. If you can beat us at wickedness, I will be more than pleased. The message which the Statue of Liberty has for us is that we are near the Customs Office and the Immigration Bureau. We fought England for seven years to gain what we are pleased to call our freedom, and now we are under the heels of trade unions. The equality of all was the greatest lie ever put over a nation of simple farmers, for that is what we were then. The present generation is a generation of gamblers. Today, the country is saturated with motor cars and the streets filled with unemployed. What poor Roosevelt is going to do with the country is a terrible problem. The machinery of the state has become a business for experts to deal with, yet we continue in the simple ways of the Boers before the Jameson raid. With our present complicated problems, we are still carrying on with the worn out idea of government by honest morons. We in America need a Mussolini or a Hitler. Our democracy is the most perfect machinery for preventing anyone from doing anything. From Wilhelm II in 1935, Pulteney received the bust of the former Kaiser as a birthday gift. From Kaiser Wilhelm II, Pulteney in 1937 received a gift of a porcelain bust of Martin Luther. The bust was delivered to Pulteney at his home at Malden on Hudson by Lieutenant General Friedrich von Bolticher, military and air attaché in Washington, D.C. from 1933 to 1941. If one looks closely, at the fireplace mantel in Pulteney's home, there are small busts likely to be the two just mentioned. He had retired to the family homestead at Malden on the west bank of the Hudson River, some 90 miles from New York City. One must assume that his health was failing. In January of 1954, he entered the Dale Sanitarium where he died at age 98. His papers are held in the New York Public Library. His correspondence includes letters from Henry George and many other prominent persons. It is unclear to me whether his support for George and the single tax was in any way effective. His involvement merely highlights the fact that persons of very diverse ideological beliefs somehow found common ground with Henry George. <laughs>